So welcome, Stephen. Thanks, Christina. Hi, Judith. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> We've been chatting a little bit about how to create longevity in your career and how do you move from A to B and potentially change business types and even industries. And Stephen, you've been a bit of a master at that. So we'd love to just explore that conversation and mm. just see what your insights have been and, and what our insights have been, because we've been on similar paths as well. So that's our topic for today. It sounds like fun, which is probably the thing I always look for in a job. If I'm not having fun, I find a new job. And fortunately, I haven't had to do that very often. So if it's not fun, if it's not singing along, if you're not getting enjoyment out of doing what you're doing, you haven't found what you should be doing. That well, I'm a firm believer in that. You've got to have passion in everything that you do and fun first, because how miserable would it be if you, you know, virtually were working day in, day out and not having fun? I mean, I mean, let's face it, you're not going to have fun every day, are you? You're not going to have true. like, you know, they call it work for a reason. Right? Yeah. So, but let's say um, it's work that you love doing and it would be good to have a laugh every once in a while while you're at work and like the people that you work with. I think yeah. that's really important. So true. Mm. I'm, I'm going to fess up. I, I've done jobs that I've absolutely hated, absolutely hated. And the biggest, it was probably one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made. Mm. Um, so um, disclosure, Stephen's also my husband. Um, I would come home from this particular job and I would cry, yeah. I would cry every night. Mm. I had um it was I had a really bad boss and yeah it's it's not something you want to do so my advice is get out do what you love get, get and, out and have it. fun and and fun is different things it's not just about having a game and playing and uh, socializing and I find in work fun is doing new things or exploring a, a passion related to your work that's part of that can be part of your job so you know, I've, I've done across a lot of jobs in different industries. I've always had an interest in data and numbers. And you, I get, you know, a real sense of enjoyment out of discovering new things from the data that you can then use to change the path of organisations or to change the path of your career. Because it... data's never been my big thing. <laughs> but well, it's... What's, what's fun for one person is not fun. For exactly. Exactly. And that's and not then... so brilliant, right? That's what's so brilliant about workplaces is that you have the different yeah. strengths. And... Like, m most people don't think that I was ever an accountant, which is what my degree is in, because I'm you know, very creative and innovative in what I do. But I think the benefit of having an accounting background was on I'm really good with numbers and love using numbers to to create innovative opportunities. And because if you're doing something new and different, you'll always get the naysayers in any organization saying, well, that hasn't been done. We'd rather stay with what we're doing. But if you can start showing them some proof points along the way, and numbers can be a really good thing, particularly if it's the accountant you're trying to, to justify this to, then, you know, that's for me, that's one of the things, senses of enjoyment. You might have a a very creative passion that you want to do, um, which has happened to me at times in organisations. But the way you get to first base is to show an economic rationalisation of that first to do the really creative thing that's going to be in, that's going to involve taking a financial risk for the organisation. Exactly right. And, and, you know, for the for the young ones out there listening, going into their first job, the reality is sometimes you got to take your first jobs uh, to learn something and to mm. develop your skills. And that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to go in there and it's going to be, oh gosh, I love doing this. And I love, you know, and it, you're, you're not necessarily, but if you're learning something, that's what's going to be important. But also you need to respect who you're, you're working with, that you, you, you respect those people and you respect what the organization is doing. And, um, but it, it might not be really fun because, mm. you know, you, uh, often you remember us going into our first jobs, like they could have been really highly admin focused and we had to learn virtually those steps, every step first, before we would get to that next stage. And, you know, my first job was um, when I went into corporate was a, a receptionist. And I thought at, at the bank, and I thought I won the lottery because I knew um, that if I got that role, that I'd get to meet people. And and I didn't go in there going, yeah, I'm going to be, you know, I, I went in there thinking, okay, I got to learn this. I got to meet people. 
And if I do, then that might lead me to some something else. And it did. I was in that role for, I don't know, probably about three or four months before someone said, you know, starts talking to me about something else in another area. So that was, that was fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first job, Christina, going in? How fun was that? Um, I was so ambitious. I was, I was prepared to do anything. Like I just wanted to get a, I just wanted to get ahead. And I was really fortunate that I started out at, um, in the early days of kind of MLC Lend Lease. And I was very young at that time. And the culture in that organization, I'm going way back now, um, was that you actually, they encouraged um, the up and comers to work in all different parts of the organization. So a lot of people started in customer service. Other people started in other, I started in a junior product manager or a support product manager role. But they moved me around a lot because they wanted me, they wanted anybody that came in at that time to have an understanding of the entire business. And there are, there are jobs that I did that weren't fun, but I was learning about that. I was learning a different perspective. And Judith, you and I have talked a lot about different perspectives. And I think that's the important thing about you know, you've done that too. You've, yeah. you've been in senior marketing roles. You've come from a data background. You've worked in all sorts of areas. So the more areas that you work in, you actually start to get an appreciation of other people's perspectives and other people's roles. Because if you've just been in that one area, you might not appreciate the creative area. If you've always been, no offense to the accountants, mm. but if you're, you've always been a numbers person and you haven't appreciated the creativity of the, the marketing team and the salespeople can be very creative too, um, then you don't actually get an understanding for what the benefit of those attributes are. And you're, you're a bit unusual, yeah. Stephen. You've you've got that blend. Yeah, look, my, my very first full-time job was with the Herald and Weekly Times or News Corp, as it's better called now, better known now. I was partway through my degree and you had to go and work for you in the middle of your degree. So I went out and never came back and finished my degree part-time. But I worked for News Corp, or let's call it News Corp because that's simpler, because my one of my passions was newspapers. And my mum had a terrible time because I'd get three newspapers every day and have to read every page, starting with the sport and getting to the front bit. Starting but with I the just, sport, nothing's I just, changed. <laughs> I just loved my newspapers and I'd train my dog to get the newspaper and bring it to that front door every morning. So I thought I'm going to work for a newspaper. And back then, I won't say what year it was, but I worked in what was known as the commercial room in accounts payable. It was pre-computers. So we're using a printing calculator to add things up. The chief accountant still wore an eye shade and an armband to keep his sleeves up. <laughs> yeah. But it was such a fun place to work back then because it was like a family. You had, it wasn't just about the accountants. You had it was the Herald and Weekly Times, so you had the Herald newspaper, the Sun newspaper, you had the journalists and the photographers down the hallway. There was a radio station, one of Melbourne's most popular radio stations downstairs in the basement, and you got to meet all these people. You'd wander down to the radio station and have a chat to the DJs. You'd go out to the photographers and look at their photos. There was the paper's cartoonists who would do cartoons as birthday cards if you got to know them. It was just a, a fun place to work, and while, you know, Typing in, uh, adding up invoices every day was no fun. I learned a huge amount just about culture and the experience and teams from working in a really diverse organisation back then, pre-technology. Um, from then yeah, on... That was before Slack, way before, yeah. way before Slack. And then I lasted there for about two years, but made a lot of friends and had a lot of fun and learnt a lot. And then from there, I went to organisations... Um, in varying states of moving into technology. So technology has also been a big part of my career in applying that um, to customer solutions as well as to business processes. So how did you get into banking from there? How did you transition into banking? Well, I went... Because you had a big career in I banking. I went from publishing to travel to health insurance and I might have missed a couple along the way. But in the end, I decided I was really good at marketing and innovation now, I was really good with numbers and money, so I should sell money. And therefore, I thought I should go and work for a bank because then I can help banks sell money, which puts two of my core competencies together. And I decided by then I didn't want to be an accountant. I thought I'd rather create the future than record the past. So I wanted to move into strategy, marketing around you know financial services, essentially. 
So, so how is it that, because most people go into a career and they go, I'm working in financial services and, or they're working in construction or whatever they're working in and they kind of do the graduate, you know, recruitment thing and then they move their way through the ranks. But a lot of people are actually very nervous about moving between industries. Um, and you've done it. I've done mm. it. What is it? what is it that makes you confident about changing industries or what is what is that magic that helps you just go yeah i'll just change i'll just apply my skills in another industry what's the well, i think the, it, for, the, for me it was just thinking about things that interested me my first job was in newspapers then i moved to travel because i wanted to travel a bit and learn about travel so i did that for three or four years and um <clears throat> working in health insurance was my bridge from accounting to strategy and marketing so I consciously it was an interesting organization because back then the the big health insurance funds and HBA was the one I worked for they were incredibly trusted brands they were strong brands every family had it so it was a a known brand and a something I knew but that was the bridge from strategy to from accounting to strategy and marketing and from there I leapt into financial services and that was because I you know I enjoyed numbers I enjoyed money I knew I wanted to start doing more in marketing and saw an opportunity to thought banking was a good match for it um I yeah. think a lot of people underestimate their ability to transition from industry to industry and um, I know my mother when when I was young she said do a business degree because because I had no idea what I wanted to do and I in some ways I still don't <laughs> Yeah. And you know what? That's a good thing yeah. because that's a good thing because you're still learning and growing. Yes, exactly. And she and she said, do a business degree because then that can transfer. And then, you know, when I was headhunting and I'd interview, I've interviewed thousands of people over the year. The people who um kept uh, kept their minds open to transition were usually the ones who um had particular skills in business that they could just transfer so they had no problem going from banking to fast moving consumer goods to and that made them highly marketable as well and um they didn't put any barriers they'd go sure i can do that because i know how to run a team i know how to manage a profit and loss sheet i know how mm. to lead i i can take that from banking into uh fast moving consumer goods or to retail and um absolutely yeah. Skills can and Skills. I think for me, I've always been very much customer driven and all the organizations I've worked in get sick of me saying we've got to put the customers first and customers who we're dealing with, they're not dealing with products, they're dealing with us and we're dealing with them. And once you have that customer mindset, whether I'm working in health insurance or banking or telecommunications or travel or whatever, it's the same customers. If you understand customers and their needs, it's, it's people that it's buy things. People buy things, and then you need to understand what's important for them from a fi financial product or a travel product or a telephone product. Um, but customers are the constancy throughout all of that, and and if you focus on that, it's not hard to move industries. Everything has a customer experience. Absolutely. Yeah, and they're the same customers. We don't banks same... have the same customers that telcos have, and the same customers that travel companies we just as customers have relationships with lots of brands in different industries i mean i always looked at the fact that um you know you've got to when you're when you're going into a new business or a new new job or whatever the first and foremost the most important thing as a skill level is being able to communicate communicate with people and understanding just the basic common courtesies and how to deal and how to hand and handle people and then connecting yep. So they true, so connect true. You. So connect true. with the right people and collaborate with them. <laughs> I'm coaching somebody at the moment and she's a very, very bright and talented young lady and she's just moving through that um, from doing to managing leading and and it's really, it's really beautiful to watch and to coach because we get so caught up in needing to know the, the, the skill of being able to do the output, being on the tool, so to speak. And the more you go through your career, it's more around what you were just talking about, Judith. It's, it's understanding people, being able to communicate, understanding human nature, um, understanding a bit of psychology. 
uh, good manners, mm. <laughs> <laughs> inclusiveness. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things that become way more important than being on the tools. And yet we all get caught up in, oh my goodness, I don't know. I don't know the specifics of this job or this industry. It's like, well, actually, that's not what we're paying you to do. We're actually paying you to do the other things, to lead, to manage, to lead conversations, to engage people in different perspectives. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. It's the same stuff. Well, one of my first managers said to me ages ago, make sure you hire people better than you at that, you know, make sure you surround. You said that. Yeah, yeah. You said that. With good people and, you know, you're not going to be a master of everything. You're not going to know everything, but get people. And also, if you've ever read Richard Branson's book, they're great books. He says the same thing. He got, he, he got people in who were really smarter than him, is what he said, in what they do. And you can't do everything when you're running a business. And if you try, you can do poor, you need to know what is the functions are in your business, but you're not going to be the best at it. No, Somebody and you, can, you and you can't micromanage the future and strategy. That's where you really need your really smart people. If it's a small, if it's a very disciplined business process, then maybe there is more micromanagement. But if I'm creating the future, which has always been one of my mottos about wherever I work, you want really smart people where you together work out a strategy, then let them go and they do their part of it. You don't need to supervise them every day. You catch up once a week to review progress. You. Be, you become more a strategic problem solver than you do actually running every project day to day. It's the problem solving, getting through the speed over the speed humps or the bottlenecks you find along the way that becomes really valuable. Exactly. Like clearing yeah. the pathways for yeah. us to do yeah. their job. Yeah. Picking up the doggy do so no one else steps in it. <laughs> <laughs> that too. And giving them the the um, go ahead to do it. Yeah. Don't micromanage them, giving them the the uh, responsibility to do it. Yeah. Um, because they are good at it. Yeah, it's showing trust, essentially. Trust. Yeah. Trust. That's a word we don't hear very often these days. No, well, it was funny because that was what, again, I've given speeches on trust going back more than 20 years. Um, because working in banking, we, you know, banking, traditional bank people thought they had loans and deposits and maybe credit cards and those sorts of things. But banking is fundamentally a trust business. And unless you, unless organisations and people fundamentally trusted banks, they may still dislike them, they wouldn't be putting their money and everything with them. So most banks don't manage trust actively, but if you manage it more actively, almost as a product, then you start reinforcing trust to your customers and give them more reasons to stay and more reasons to have more of their relationship with you. Um, so trust, trust for your employees. You're humanising. You're, you're, you're humanising. So trust, trust is really an incredibly important thing for most industries, but in, particularly in, in financial services, really important. And we found working in transport the last 10 years really important there because people aren't going to use a form of transport where they think their lives or their safety may be at risk. So it's how do you identify trust factors and barriers to trust and overcome them and apply that to whatever industry, whatever product you're in. But trust is, um, you know, if I just do a quick a quick think of the major industries, trust yeah. is critical to every industry. Yeah. You're not going to sign up with a building contractor in a construction environment unless you trust yeah. that they're going to do the development for you. You're not going to put your parents into an aged care facility unless you trust them. You're not going to go to a hospital for major surgery unless yeah. you trust them. You're not going to go to a childcare to a child care centre yeah in a childcare environment, unless you trust them. So I think fundamentally we're yeah. all selling trust. But a lot of organisations don't actively manage trust. They don't. Um, but that comes so back that's, to the people. Yeah, in, in the, the organisation. think about yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Because organisations don't make decisions, people do. And also the trust from your workforce. Mm. Because at the it's end critical. of the day, if your employees don't trust you, why are they going to work for you? Why are they going to work a little later for you? Why are they going to make that extra effort? And I actually think if I put my headhunter hat back on, the ones that I could headhunt out of organization didn't have that strong, strong bond with their employer. Like, that, you know, they might have loved their job or whatever. Or movable. The next step. They, but the ones that were immovable were the ones 
that were so bonded with their organization they were it was like a family for them and it was they, it was very much like i'm not going to move unless it's just too good to to pass up and that, that that was very hard because the companies had spent time to make sure that they built trust and so and for an example you know uh, companies that um where the employees don't have to ask for an increase that the employer says to them, you've done such a great job, we wanna give you an increase or we wanna give, they're proactive instead of reactive with their workforce. And I know that's um, few and far between these yeah. days, but, but that's, the, that's the key I think in building a really solid um, workforce is, is being proactive with them and building that trust. So they know you, they've got, um, the company has your back. And they're gonna, and even if they do leave, they're going to go with fond memories. You know, if they do leave, they're going to go, I loved working there, you know, the great people. And they keep those connections through their work life. Because there was um, one organization that I recruited to that had an awesome culture. And and they built the company up to a, a, a really good level. They eventually sold. But all those people in those early days were so bonded. And they kept their connections throughout their careers and some of them when the company before they sold um they got to a certain level in their position they couldn't go any farther because the company just didn't have the role and so they would leave the company but because of the great experience that they had they would come back when the higher level role was available yeah. so you know they'd go out and get some experience for a couple of years somewhere else but they kept those connections and they loved the company and that that's such a cool thing to see i mean that is great when you see companies treating people like that so basic i mean it really is it's like treat it people like human them. skills doesn't it i mean at the yeah. end of the day strip everything away it's you know as we said earlier people make decisions you know, organizations aren't buildings, organizations are made up of people and people make decisions and, and it's the human skills. Yeah. But my, my experience with that was NAB. I was there for nearly 10 years, which is, I think, the longest I've ever worked anywhere. Um, but it was a great culture, great organization. And I think Don Argus was the CEO through most of that time. And a lot of it would go back to Don and the team he built around him was just fantastic. So we could we could make major changes relatively quickly and the, and had huge success for a sustained period. But then a lot of that core team, we all sort of left NAP about the same time, all with fond memories, went to other banks or consultants because we all had the confidence to leave because we knew we were good at what we were doing and could take our skills elsewhere. And within industries, different organisations are at different points in their development and different industries are at different points. And because of what we'd done at NAB back then, particularly in building all around customer information and customer-driven strategies that generated NAB's success, we were way ahead on the customer curve than other industries and every other bank in Australia. So that gave everybody at, who was involved in that at NAB a chance to go out as consultants to banks, to technology companies, pretty much all around the customer stuff and bringing that, I, I went to ComBank, um, one, of, one of my other friends at NAB went to Bain Consulting, others went to Microsoft, and but it was all because of what we'd done around customers that created those opportunities. And then a lot of us linked up outside of NAB and worked together in different ways. So, you know, really good example of that. And that some, but also That's sometimes so yeah. you get people who don't have the confidence to leave, and sometimes that becomes an issue for, for, for organizations. They're good at what they do but they probably don't have the risk-taking um, part of their personality that gives them the confidence to leave a little bit. I used to have a, a fridge magnet saying everything is sweetened by risk. And um, mm -hmm. I really thought about it that way. If you don't take, you know, in banking risk return, the greater the risk, the greater return, also the greater the downfall. But in your life, if you're not going to take risks, you're not going to learn and experience new things. Now, what you said there about working at uh, the NAB in the early days, and you kept contact with those people. Yeah. And so they became a really important part of your network that you could um, probably call upon during during your career journey. If you're not making those contacts, if you're not, you know, you're not bonding. Now, let's just say you were, you were um, at NAB back then and you were working from home full time, didn't go into the office. 
and you were doing your job and you were happy doing it, but you didn't get to go in and you didn't meet people, those connections aren't knocking on your front door. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's much harder it. now. I think I think people now need to work more. It's it's they need to put in more effort to create those connections and build those relationships and build that trust. Um, because it is harder. It is it is much harder. Do you think so? Now I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it out here that I'm thinking, um, I actually don't think it's harder. I just think it's different. Because yeah. I because I think of it from the point of view, geez, if I would have had my started my executive search business now, this would have been fantastic. Because I would have <laughs> been able, I would have been able to go on to LinkedIn, all those like like when I started, we had this thing called the blue book that was published once a year that you could go down to Collins Street, the books business bookstore and get it. And it had all the companies and all it had was the CEOs and their their um, a couple of their leadership team. And that's how I would be able to find out who's who. And the only other way is basically knocking on doors and meeting people. Now, if I could have gone on LinkedIn and said, <laughs> hey, yeah, search, let's mm. do it. I think it's harder. I think it's harder because you have to make an effort. Like, it's harder because when we were all growing up in in corporate land, we were all in the office because there wasn't a pandemic, and you would bump into people, and there'd be all that incidental stuff, and you'd meet people through through incidental and interactions. Whereas now, you actually have to make an effort, and there seems to be, and I know this is going to be a subject of one of our other podcasts. There seems to be a bit of a trend towards texting, slacking, WhatsApping, and not actually picking up the phone. So it's harder because you're actually having to make more of an effort and get beyond the fear of picking up a phone to have a conversation to build a relationship. But I agree, yeah. agree with you from the perspective of having more data available. Mm. You know who all the executives are. Oh, that's so much easier. But you still got to, excuse me, pull your finger out. Yeah, and actually put some effort in. You, you can do a lot of things remotely, and you know, I'm, I've been working remotely for 20 years, so since way before COVID. Um, but I, I guess what I enjoy when you do get to the face to face stuff is some of the whiteboarding sessions. Yes, there are online whiteboarding tools, but it's not the same as standing in the room with other people. Everybody's got a different color pen in their hand, and you're rubbing things out. You're constructing off each other, putting real sticky notes on screen on a whiteboard screen, not your PC screen. Yeah. Um, and those you're sort of fun things doing it. <laughs> really, really, you don't need to do them every day, but you still need those sort of in interactions occasionally. I had, I went to a conference or a workshop two or three weeks ago, and there were about fifty people, and I knew a lot of them through online interactions, but a lot of them I'd never met in person before. And on that particular day, we mm. had the butcher's paper and we had the post-it notes out and we made more progress in you know three or four hours that day than you could ever make in any other way. And that's created huge opportunities for all of us. But it wasn't, of that... just, yeah, but it wasn't just progress around an issue. Yeah. It was you made progress. I didn't go to this session. Stephen made progress around relationships mm. because these are people that he had connections with through LinkedIn and who liked all his posts and he was engaging with, but that actually built the trust. There's the yeah. word again, built the trust. So they took a phone call from Stephen around another opportunity because that trust and that relationship had been built. Yeah. Imagine if you had all the skills, like for instance, I mean, the, the reason why, I get excited about the fact that, you know, if I had that business, if I was running that business now and what I could do is because when early in my career, I was able to learn from other people who were walking down that path of sales and approaching people because I was in the office and I was watching what they were doing and learning from them. And the, and I think what an issue is these days, and like you were saying, Christina, people are texting, they're not picking up the phone. You can't build a relationship if you don't pick up the phone. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you can try, and some will, but it's very difficult. And and the thing is, you need to, you need to learn the skill of communication. Imagine if you were one of those people today that learn the skill of picking up the phone and going and meet someone 
taking that advantage because let's face it, the basics of years gone by are the basics of today. And they're just applied a different way. So we have different tools that we can use, but the basics of you got to, you got to build a relationship with people. Like I said, you got to build trust. You got to get them on site. And the big one, when you were trying to develop business, whether you're in a, a job where you've got to bring business in or your own business, is you've got to know how to close. Right? And it's very hard to close. Something. We had these yeah, conversations yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah. We strategize around how we close. <laughs> you can't close if you don't ask questions, you don't interact. I mean, if I had to sit there and try to close on an email or a texting thing, I'm sorry, but I, I, it just would not work. It would, I have to be able to talk to someone and, and if I sense something's not right or haven't got, they haven't got enough information, then I'll ask more questions. And, and also it, it's, um, I think it is a skill that comes with learning from others, but also experience of taking away the fear of asking of asking for the business or asking for whatever it is that you're trying to get from the client. Cause closing is a skill that's not just about getting business. It could be as an employee trying to close something with your own and your boss trying to get something. From I think that's boss. a fabulous yeah. session for another podcast. That's yeah. another one. That's some fun yeah. Of that. <laughs> yeah. So Stephen, some, some parting words about what worked and what didn't in terms of moving industries. Oh, look, I, I think it, every time I've changed industry, you, I enjoy the new industry. I learn from it. And whether you're as successful in one or, or another, it's about continuing to explore new things and find out what you what you enjoy and what you're good at and what's transferable and what's not. Um, yeah, it's different. And I've gone smaller and smaller, I guess, in some respects. I think one of the interesting things if you're lucky enough to work in a large business that invests in something like NAB invested in all the customer information um, systems back in the 80s and 90s, you know, I could go into smaller businesses that hadn't had that benefit, but rapidly smaller businesses could move quicker. And if they believed in a customer focus from your learnings in a big organization, you could help them get to a really strong position much quicker. And then moving into you know, our own entrepreneurial businesses, we can bring those same skills that you wouldn't otherwise have learned. And we're finding now in the in the micro mobility industry that that's a long way behind banking and telecommunications in terms of gathering customer information and how to do it. So we're at a very micro level now, but those skills are still useful every day and creating new opportunities. Absolutely. You know, that's a very good point before we let you go. Um, <laughs> just want to explore that a little bit because uh, moving industries and uh, is very similar as well from moving from a large corporate where you've been working in you know and you've had a team of 100 people and you've had people and then all of a sudden go hey I've got this entrepreneurial desire or I'm going to go into this small business that only has five people and be a partner or whatever when you're going from a large business to a small company or starting your own that has its own challenges. Oh, Absolutely. yes. Yeah. Subject of another <laughs> podcast. That's another, yeah, that, yeah. you know, and I would have executives all the time that would, they'd get to a certain point in their career and they'd go, oh, you know, I've been working for the, for the large companies for a long time. I really want to go out and do my own thing now. And, you know, I'd go, are you really, you know, careful what you wish for. Exactly. Um, careful yeah. what you wish for. You'll be turning the lights on and you'll be doing, answering the phones and you'll be doing all, do you get that? And sometimes they don't know what they don't know. So when you did that, what was it like, what were the, what were the sort of the first things that you noticed that was, what was, um, you know, like the aha moment or like, oh my God moment. <laughs> I didn't realize this was going to happen. I, get, I don't know whether I really had one of those because my first, I think the other thing you learn working in the big organisations, you understand their pain points and where they're having trouble to move. And partly it's because of their structure and culture. They can't move quickly or there are things they will never do. So if you're leaving them, you can either go out and potentially find an, another smaller employer or set up your own business to consult back to the big organisation to solve that pain point from outside because they can't do it from inside 
or you can go and work for a business or create a business that does that, solves that pain point and disrupts the big business. So I've often done things like that. I went into a company called Pinpoint that ran most of the big banks loyalty programs through the 90s and noughties. And Pinpoint were a really great organization, but they weren't into payments. And coming from banking, I went to Pinpoint and said, well, you're already in payments. You just haven't realized that loyalty is all about payments. What if we add payments to your mix? It'll supercharge your revenue and your your um, your value proposition to your customers, which they did. Pinpoint you know, continued to be successful in loyalty and in payments. And then they actually sold to MasterCard in about 2014, 15 for a huge amount. So it, it was taking things the banks couldn't do, building a business around it with Kim Harding was their CEO, who was a really passionate leader who brought lots of good people in. And then it got to a point where they were so good at what they did, then MasterCard saw the value in acquiring that and bringing it back to the industry under, under MasterCard. So, so someone going into a small <laughs> business from a large organization, what would you um, advise? What was What's one of the things that you think they should really, um, you know, sort of be aware of? Like going at what, you know. From a human perspective. From I, a human I think they really need to, one, be comfortable. They think they could work in a smaller, smaller organization, but really spend time. The smaller the organization, the more important it is to get to know the the leaders or the key shareholders if they're actively involved in the business and find out if they're really committed to the path you would like to go down in that industry or in that business. I'd, I'd forgotten about it earlier, but I went to one business in the middle of my career that I thought would have been a lot of fun, but I got in there and the chairman and CEO were were not the right people for me or most people to work with. And I could have Maybe I was too young to really interview them the right way at the time. But, you know, looking back with that particular job, I should have spent a lot more time getting to understand the key people in that organization before I left a big organization to go there. I it's think a tough one because they may only be presenting to you what they want you to see. Yeah. And therefore, the you case. don't. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, there's a there's a reason why we have prenups. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's right. And so, you know, that that's, I wouldn't beat yourself up on that because that happens a lot with people because they'll, um, if someone has an agenda or if they want you to only see what they, um, want to present, then that's, that's all you'll see. And it's happened to us. It's happened to many of us. Yeah. It's happened to all of us. And, and the thing is, I guess, um, what I would advise people in that and what I would have in the past with candidates is that um, that's where your networks become important because mm. if people who know people who know them, yeah. then you can then do sort of like, do you know who these people are? Have you ever had dealings with them? That type of thing. So do some background um, um, information or if you're going from a large organization to a small and you're not sure then you might consider going in on a contractual basis. So yeah. try, try before you buy. Yeah. And, before, and I've, I've, done that. I've done that. I've gone in as on a try before you buy. And then I was made CEO. Yeah. Well, there you go. And, and, and be upfront with them too, as far as like, Hey, you know, this is a big move for me and I'm going to, I'm, you know, um, I'm really interested and it sounds great, but how about we go in in a six month contract that gives you time to look at me and it gives me time to look at you and the organization. So we make sure it's right. Look at that, that, that can only usually happen at really senior, the more senior levels, yeah. the the more junior ones will go, you either want the job or you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, for my with the, with that company I just mentioned, I mean, the good thing was it was effectively a six month contract because I worked out in about six months that it wasn't for me and got a really good job from there. And it was a good leapfrogging opportunity. But I met some really good people in that company, despite some of their leaders. And I brought them with me or to other organizations or referred them to other friends. And they ended up getting some really good career moves, too. So even if the if the stopping point for a few months isn't great, there's opportunity in learning and meeting people through it. I think something pragmatic for me in having moved from big organisations to entrepreneurship or very, very small organisations is that 
in larger organizations, you end up doing something that's quite narrow and you spend a lot of your time leading people. But the smaller the organization you move into, the more you have to be able to do things yourself. Mm. So you need to be good on Excel. You need to be good on PowerPoint. You need to be good on Canva. You need to be good on social media. So all of a sudden you become, you have to be good at a whole bunch of things plus do the strategy, plus do the sales, plus close deals. Mm. Um, so it, it actually is, and I think it's it's going to be worthwhile, Judith, you and I have talked about this, that we actually have a completely separate subject on this um, because it, it is quite significant. Don't underestimate if you've been a long time in a large organisation and you've been supported by lots of people who have done lots of things with you, for you, um, it's a very, very different world going into a much smaller organization or into a, a two, three, four person startup. And that's where I've seen a lot of people over the years have issues because they don't they don't know what they don't know. And then they are used to sort of running a big show and having um, things paid for for them and getting a regular salary. Well, that's the other yeah. thing. Well, that's the other thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then going into a smaller situation where you know what, you do have to do everything. You do have to be quality control. You have to be the person who gets out there and knocks on the doors and makes the calls and closes the sale. You are, that's what you have to do, like, right? And then based on that success, you can start hiring people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually good for the owner or the, or the people who are running the show to understand what all the uh, the mechanics, what the mechanics are, so that when they do start hiring people, they understand what that role involves, and they do hire people who can do it better. Because again, we like we discussed, you're not going to be great at everything, but you do need to, when you're going into um, a small business and setting one up, you you need to do a lot of work, and you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna work a lot harder and a lot longer than you would have where you were just doing one particular role where you had your leave and your journey yeah. of everything. It doesn't, that doesn't happen when you're, and that's the trade-off. And, and again, Christina, that's probably another whole show. Well, Stephen, yeah. it's been an absolute delight. It's been fun. Thank Judith, you for just doing it. Thank you. <laughs> I think that this was a two coffee show. <laughs> <laughs>